everybody, Postables, Hallmarkies, and friends. I am your host today, Casey, and I am joined by my two lovely co-hosts. First up being Cammie the Hook Tardy. Say hello. Bonjour, Postables. And she comes tonight with a French accent because we are doing From Paris with Love. But before we get into that, I also have Jess. Say hello. Hey, Postables. Alrighty, you guys, and I am so excited today to introduce to you our guest host today. You all have been asking, when is Alameda and Downing going to be on the blog or on the podcast? Well, we have her. We have the lovely Shandell, who is brilliant in my writer. Who's <laughs> <laughs> the brilliant writer of the Alameda and Downing blog. Say hello, Shandell. Hi, everybody. Good to see so, you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. We're really excited. Um, you're very popular among the postables. You're most requested. It is an absolute honor for us to have you as our guest today. So um, before we dive in a little deeper, we have a couple questions for you. Um, if you don't mind introducing um, how you got the Alameda and Downing blog started for those of the postables who are a little newer who may not know who you are. So there's a long version and then there's a short version. Um, the short version is, is that I was um, a fan of the show, um, kind of started a little bit late. Um, I saw the pilot when it aired and I kind of didn't like it. I was like, this show is going to be awful. And um, a lot of people know that the, the reason was is because I had, I had some stuff going on with my heart that I really needed to kind of get worked out. And I kind of had a come to Jesus moment about three or so months later. Um, I caught the show like one or two times when it first aired. Um, and then for some reason, I just decided to go back and watch them all. Like I actually found every single episode and kind of as part of that heart change was kind of me seeing the show from a different perspective. And so by the time that kind of the January and or so um, of 2015 rolled around, I was kind of watching the show and I was really into it. And by the time, I guess, right before From Paris With Love aired, I decided that I was going to start a blog. Like I, it was kind of out of the blue. I really didn't know what I was doing when I started. I just knew that there's a lot of information out there about this show. It would be really awesome if it had one singular place to live. And that was Alameda and Downing. That's awesome. And if you guys have not checked out Shandell's blog, Alameda and Downing, you guys need to do it. I mean, you will rabbit hole for days and you'll just keep going back and you'll watch the movies and you'll see something and you'll check and it's just like fantastic i mean just the way your mind works and puts the pieces together is amazing to me like especially after um so I, i've read your blog before um like on a whim not necessarily with the movies like i'll watch a few movies and i'm like oh yeah um but when i was doing the recap notes for from paris with love tonight and then I'm going back. I'm like, oh man, there's so much here. It's amazing. <laughs> so that's because Martha Williamson is amazing. And I just have the pleasure of coming along aside her to kind of uncover all the things that end up hidden in her scripts. Yeah. And we all appreciate we, that. We talk about Martha often mm -hmm. and the weaver that she is on this loom of words and storylines. And oh yes, we, we are very big fans of Martha's intertwining of genius yes. <laughs> yeah. and she's an awesome person which makes it like 10 times better so. <laughs> better <laughs> yeah so let's jump into that real quick we know that you have gone to visit the set um during yeah. the filming of higher ground mm -hmm. so what was that like because Jess Cammy and I talked about that and we would be so like starstruck for lack of better words well, it was incredible, just like you'd imagine. Um, I was a little, a little bit starstruck myself, um, just because it kind of started out the night before I went to set, where I got to meet Gregory Harrison and Zach Santiago. So, like, it kind of started out like kind of small but big at the same time, and I'm meeting Martha, and so I'm, I'm just having this like huge introduction to this space and to these people, and then the next day I find myself literally immersed in the world of the DLO, and it's just this incredibly detailed space. Um, I just, there almost are, are no words for it, but it definitely feels like home when you go there. Um, I felt like I was going there not just as Chandel, but kind of as the postables, like kind of the stand-in for mm -hmm. all of us, just kind of being in that, in that space, and that's kind of the responsibility I 
had when I went there kind of in like in my heart and then in my intention to report back. But I mean, it was incredible. Everybody on set was incredibly nice and just like wanted to know my story, like how I came to, to do the show. I found out that they may or may not have actually been looking at the blog beforehand and like maybe laughing at some of the things that I was writing because they're like either she's really close or she's like super far away. Like they almost used it as like a sounding board to kind of see like how close we were to, to um, figuring out what some of the plot lines and things were. And it was just very interesting to kind of see be the kind of bridge between those two spaces. And that's kind of, you know, kind of the spaces that I think the blog holds and that I still kind of hold, you know, in this in this space. Yeah, for sure. That is, that's amazing. I mean, we've all talked about how we would love to be like, I don't know, at the Sholiver wedding as a guest (laughs) (laughs) or in, you know, the new DLO or whatever space they create just to, you know, just taking it all in and just seeing it in person. I'm sure that is just once in a lifetime kind of opportunity, you know, feels like a blur. Like I barely remember the day. So I'm really glad that like I have a notebook and like some videos and things that kind of can remind me, yes, I was there. And yes, this really happened. Mm -hmm. But I mean, everybody was just so great. I mean, all the actors, they, you know, I had to be very careful because they were actually trying to do their job at the same time. So it was very important for me to like, you know, make sure that when I did try and interact with them, that it was kind of in between scenes and in ways that like wouldn't interfere with kind of the work that they were doing. But yeah, I mean, Mm -hmm it's it's absolutely worth it yeah do you want to share the quick story about how you might have maybe got caught stupid (laughs) oh okay yeah um this actually the story actually appears on the blog so if you visit the set visit section it's on there um one of the times kind of in between scenes i was kind of like looking around at, at oliver's desk in particular um and eric had left sides which essentially are pages of script that the actors are trying to memorize for you know either later in the day or the following day it was actually the script for the following day so i'm around (laughs) i'm kind of going around his desk and kristen out of the blue is like eric your size she literally yelled like you just kind of hear her she's like 10 like less than 10 feet away and is like yelling at eric to pick up his his notes (laughs) and i laughed but i realized like way way later that if I had read them, I would have uncovered that final scene between them, that clash in the, in the DLO that they have in like the final minutes of Higher Ground, because that was what they ended up filming the following day. So <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I was so close, you guys. But then I was like, wow, that would have really messed some stuff up <laughs> you know, to sort of know that piece of the story and kind of how all that came together. I was really lucky though, Martha did let me read the first six pages of the script. Verse six and only six. So I did get to read some of the higher ground script, Mm -hmm. but obviously not like the juiciest stuff, which was fine (laughs) because I would have hated to have that spoiled. It was just really incredible. Yeah. And how, what was the timeline between the filming to the movie? Um, So I was there kind of like mid November of 2016 and then it came out in February of 2017. So just a few weeks or a few months, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. And they were trying to get filming done before Americans Thanksgiving. So they were kind of filming kind of right up into the November 23rd, 24 kind of timeline that year. Gotcha. Well, I mean, that that's a lot like what, four months of if you would have uncovered that, like a big juicy spoiler, you probably would have had to sign all the <laughs> waivers. We'll not sell state secrets. Yeah. That's and funny. I already knew about Steve. I saw a picture of him of him in the um what was it? Was it the hair and makeup trailer? No, it was the uh, the wardrobe trailer. There was a picture of him on the wall, and I did not put two and two together. And then later, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally had that scoop right there. It's oh. <laughs> too funny. Yeah. So you've mentioned before that um, From Paris with Love is your favorite. Is yeah. it still your favorite? And what's one thing that draws you to this movie? Absolutely, 100%. I think there's kind of a... Um, a lot of things that make it my favorite. I think the first is that there's like an, a tremendous amount of nostalgia <laughs> associated with it. One, because it was the first movie that I ever reviewed uh, for A&D. Second, uh, you know, I started the blog the day before. And then third, it just has this unique cinematic quality to it. I mean, between kind of that, like the old Hollywood, like in Holly and like the different, um, like, you know, aesthetics that they use and then the different, um, like the postcards that kind of flip around and they use as transitions and just the story itself, which is this really grand kind of romantic love story. And it's just told in such a beautiful way. And so I think for me, that just is, is completely timeless. The, the real question is what don't I like about from Paris with love? And the answer is nothing. 
Okay. Wow. Yeah. So what about you guys, okay, Cammy? <laughs> I think that covered it. We're all done. And done. We are wrapped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Cammy and Jess, and I'll start with Cammy. What did you guys think overall thoughts about From Paris with Love? Well, this was the first exposure that I had to SSD. Uh, and I didn't, I had, I think I happened upon it and I saw Eric Mabius and I had seen the movie, How to Fall in Love. That was the first thing I ever saw Eric in and I loved it. And I loved how nerdy he was. And so then I just happened to turn on the Hallmark channel and I see, and I see Eric Mavius, I'm like, oh, that guy from How to Fall in Love, I'll, I'll, I'll check this out. And then I started seeing flashbacks, I'm like, oh, okay, there's something going on between him and the blonde lady. Okay, okay. And <laughs> so, so, yeah, this was the first time that I had ever seen anything related to Sign Seal Delivered, and I just loved the energy. I loved the energy. I loved the plot line. It was different, you know, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Dear God with Greg Kinnear, but it's also about a, a, a dead letter office and they take all of the letters to God that come in to the DLO and they answer them. And so they, uh, so they help out all of these people. And so putting, putting the fact that Eric Mavius was in the movie and then that it was about a DLO and they were helping people, I just said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And, and then of course, you know, I clapped eyes on, uh, on Kevin McGarry and I went, hello. <laughs> Because that was the first time I had ever seen him, and I just went, wow, that man is seriously attractive. <laughs> so, You're not wrong. No, I know that. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, I couldn't get over it. He just, he stood, he stood there and smiled at, at Brooke Nevins, at the character of Caitlin, and I was like, okay, 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 calm down, calm down, don't look straight into the blue light, <laughs> <laughs> the blue light radiating from his eyes because yeah I thought that he was incredibly good looking and then it just you know it that blended in from the first meeting and then it goes straight into their wedding so I just I loved it so as I've seen the rest of the story and I've become a fan I really really like this one mostly because it gets rid of Holly <laughs> Because she is such an obstacle for the pilot and the and the series and just and and the Christmas movie, you know. So now she's out of the way and and Shane and Oliver can get on with their lives. But you know, as as a as just a storyline like Shandell, so romantic, so sweet, this couple that had lost each other but then came back together. I mean, it, it's, it's the perfect love story. So. For sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of postables agree with you on it gets rid of Holly. Yes. <laughs> At least that's what I see on Twitter. Wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> so Jess, what are your overall thoughts on this movie? Yeah. I feel like at least from what I got of the puzzles, many of them don't like it because Holly's in there to begin with. But I am more with Chandel. I love this movie. It's probably in my top three. Um, I don't. I don't want to say too much because we're. Gonna, I would rather wait till we talk about those certain areas. But I just think there's such a depth to this movie, and it really shows some of their their true character in in a good way. Yeah. So funny thing, I, so I watched, started this series a few years ago and I was like, I was super, you know, hooked in, obviously that's why I'm here. And I decided to rank them all. And this, <laughs> this ended, this movie ended up last and not because it was bad, but I think it's because I had just got, uh, I think I had gotten off of the, you know, the to the altar high and the higher ground high and everything that I kind of had forgotten about this movie. So it just kind of uh... defaulted to last. And I was like, ah, eh, you know, it was, 
Holly, blah, blah. But then I watched it this time around and I've watched it millions of times since. And each time I watch it, I find something new and I've liked it more and more. But this time around, as I'm taking furious notes, and if you follow me on Twitter, I have like 20 pages of notes and now it's condensed to six pages of type notes. I'm like, oh my goodness, this movie is brilliant. This has moved up way, 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 way up. I, I don't know that I can necessarily rank it, but it is definitely not last for sure. I would say it's definitely maybe my top five now. Maybe. We'll see. But well, uh, 22, that's saying something. Yeah. <laughs> that is saying something. <laughs> for sure. Jumped pretty significantly. Yeah. I don't know that I rank the episodes. I, I rank the movies and the okay. pilot, but still, it's still a significant jump because there's, what, 12 movies out there? But all right. So let's dive into From Paris with Love. We are going to do something a little different. If you've been um listening to our podcast since the beginning usually we do like a letter story and then you know the postable story but that's impossible impossible to do with this so we're gonna break it up by day um hit the highlights talk about different things um so let us know if you like that format let us know if it makes sense let us know if we should go back to the other way um we'd be curious to know because we're doing this for you guys and we want to make sure that it's beneficial and fun for y'all to listen to so we start off on Monday, setting the stage. Oliver's at his desk examining a manila envelope addressed to Caitlin, who we assume is the Caitlin from the opening scene. And before I go any further, Caitlin is played by Brooke Nevin and her husband, Joey, is played by the blue-eyed gorgeous Kevin McGarry. I just had to put that out there for Cammie. Um, so... Um, you mean you're putting it out there for all the Hardies? Oh, and them too. <laughs> I hope you're listening too, Hardies. <laughs> um, so he's, all you Team Nathan fans. All the Team Nathan fans. That's just for you. Um, Rita's also practicing her speech. Norman is assisting with the giant golden scissors, which hysterical. Shane walks and talks about how cold it is. And notice that Oliver is quick to ask her about her birthday. Hmm. And it's not her birthday. It's next Monday. And he sings to her. He serenades her by singing Springtime in the Rockies. You guys, what do we think about all of that real fast in the opening scene? We're coming right off of um, For Christmas. So there's, we're building, we're building some romantic tension between everybody, between Shane and Oliver and Norman and Rita but for me what took me to to kind of my breath away a little bit is when he sings the line with her Abani eyes so blue and like they're facing each other and it's that music and, and she's looking at him with her very blue, blue eyes oh, no. yes uh, so I know J I'm gonna call on Jess because she's not the romantic no, I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> all right I totally own it she does. She does. She's not, she admits she's not the romantic one. That's like me and Cammie. Yeah, that's, what that's what they're for. Yeah. I'm the balance, the yin and yang here. She is, she is the mop at, to our puddles. Yes. <laughs> but what do you guys, what did you guys think initially watching that, that interaction? Well, I'll just say, so I don't know what I, I don't remember like the first time I watched it. This time when I watched it, most of that glossed over me. What really hit me this time um, was when Shane was pulling off her scarf and saying, this winter is going on and on and on. And there's, yeah, so she's pulling her scarf. And it just like hit me. Like that's such a parallel to how she's feeling with Oliver and his like battle I guess with the fact that Holly's still in his life it's like this thing with Holly is going on and on and on and can't we just be over this winter of Holly <laughs> and which continues on because spring as we know is coming which becomes the beginning of their relationship so that's actually what really hit me this time was that parallel that um, metaphor I guess that I found in that scene wow Jess my mind is blown <laughs> Y'all welcome. This is what happens when you're not a romantic and you're not, and you're not distracted by the bonnie eyes so blue. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so 
So we'll jump, we'll keep going because we have a lot to, of ground to cover. So the hey, envelope. Casey, Casey, yes. can I just say something really quick? Go ahead. I, when, when Shane says it's going to get down to eight degrees, you'll freeze your crown off. I, for the, for the first time, I've never thought this before, but for the first time, I wondered why is there no shot of the swear jar? You know, like, <laughs> like Shane's been caught. Like Shane's been caught before having to put money into the swear jar. And so maybe she, so maybe, uh, uh, maybe Oliver goes, <clears throat> and she, and she kind of looks at uh, crown off, you know, because <laughs> so, it's there, but it's never, it's never featured. And I know that Kristen Booth has tweeted about how she had to kind of get used to watching her language on set. And so I just think it would have been funny to do a quick shot featuring the swear jar right there with freezing her crown off. <laughs> and just for reference, there's 111 US and Canadian dollars in that and some like random change in that in that thing. I counted it, so. <laughs> you counted it. That's funny. Yeah, I actually counted it. <laughs> what is the price of a swear? Like, what, what do, you, do you put it in a dollar? It depends or? on what word. It depends on what word you use. And I won't lie, somebody contributed the day that I was there. And we all So heard that it is a out. functioning swear jar for the set. Yes. Yeah, it's a functioning oh swear jar. Oh my gosh. 100%. <laughs> well, I think they put some money in there, but they also, like, you have to contribute to it if you, like, say something. Like, that's the that's the thing. It's like you actually have to contribute. It, so. That is. That's why it's U.S. and Canadian dollars, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Funny. That is it's absolutely fun. funny. And uh, for those who are not on Twitter, so when there was the um, the rewatch, um, it was I think Mother's Day weekend. They did the Hallmark um, marathon. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked about the swear jar, and Eric maybe is shoved Kristen under the, the bus, bus <laughs> and Kristen <laughs> shoved Crystal under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> which is so funny go back to twitter and go try and find that tweet but it's just so funny the banter between those three all righty so enough of the swear jar here but um the envelope that oliver examines has the divorce papers from joey to caitlin and it includes joey's wedding band and shane causes oliver to fling the ring into the bin of letters which norman dumps more letters into so they've got to search for this teeny tiny ring amongst like hundreds of letters. And in searching for the ring, Shane finds what is presumed to be Oliver's letter to Holly, the one that he sent off in a hope and a future. So she takes in the rain. So we know it was going to become a dead letter. Yeah. Because, it, in the rain. because it got ruined. <laughs> <laughs> he did that on purpose. He wanted it to become lost because he didn't really want her back. <laughs> Honestly, you want to know what I think? I think that remember the guy tells um, Joey to like, like wait 10 seconds before you mail that. Yeah, and I feel like that's good. what Oliver had done is he took the 10 minute, you know, the 10 minutes really is what it felt like. But, you know, the 10 seconds to think before he mailed and mm -hmm. yeah, it happened to be in the middle of rain, which that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that is a good point. So I have a question. I have a, actually a few questions for you guys. What would you have done with the letter? If you were Shane, what would you have done? She goes up and she contemplates. She goes to the roof. She's kind of like thinking. And then she coerces Rita. I feel like it would I, depend on your emotional connection to it. Because I thought about this too. I'm like, well, would I just have kind of held it up to the light to see if I could see through the envelope, you know, to see if I could see the ink. But like, I think that it was the emotional connection to it that kind of obviously had her like not knowing what she should do mm -hmm. and kind of thinking, oh, I can pawn it off on Rita because he won't do anything to her. Like it was just, and, and I think it was out of care, not necessarily out of manipulation. I think it's just that like, Cause she's had her, she's had a stake in this too. She came alongside yeah. Oliver for this, this, this whole thing. And she needs to know where he's at. And I think the funny thing in about the letter is, is that that's where he was six months ago, but maybe isn't where he at, he's at today. I feel like that's the tension that kind of gets built up throughout the remainder of it is like, they don't really know where the other one stands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I don't quite understand about the whole letter thing is Shane says she cannot open this letter like Rita has to open the letter but then Shane has no problem just reading the letter so why does it matter who opened the letter if you were just gonna read it anyway I didn't quite understand <laughs> she also <laughs> lies <laughs> she said I read some of it to see who it was from you liar <laughs> you read the entire letter <laughs> but 
you know, pro me personally, I honestly don't know what I would have done because the fact that it got lost means that it never reached Holly. And, you know, over the course of those months, Shane and Oliver had gotten uh, closer. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would like to think, I don't know if I necessarily would do this, but I would like to think that I would have just said, Oliver, look, isn't this your letter to Holly? And then he would say, oh, so it is. And throw it in the trash. <laughs> <But> <laughs> But, and that therefore completely destroying the entire rest of the plot of this movie. <laughs> I'm talking about Let's real life here. Pollution <laughs> destroys this film. Like there is no movie after that. Like the payoff is nil because the movie doesn't exist. I don't. I don't under. I mean, I do understand why she hid it from him, but I don't totally get that. I'm like, why didn't she just? say oh look your letter to holly never made it and i think it's a battle of a lot of things within shane oh I think it, yeah it definitely, it's a battle it's of it. her care for oliver her insatiable curiosity you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things at stake there too because I, I mean i feel like i probably would have gone the shane route i probably like because that that's me it's it's funny because when my husband would watch a few you know snippets or whatever with me he's like oh you're just like that nosy girl <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyways i probably would have just gone the the shane route and probably would have coerced a friend to open but i here's the yeah. thing i would have gotten them to read the letter yeah that's kind of what i was saying like i feel like rita should have just read the letter like oh yeah this is all over his letter to holly and i don't know i feel like the moment that thing got open i would have been second second guessing like and really it's a technical it's a technical issue because really she told him she wouldn't open anything without his express permission she didn't say whether or not she would read or not read without his express permission so like the fact that she got rita to open it that that was the technicality there <laughs> so she therefore gave herself permission to take it away and read it i would have done the same yeah i've done the same i'm just that's where i'm at <laughs> i really don't know i really don't know what i would have done in that situation i've never been in anything even close to that so right I have, exactly <laughs> I have, I have right? absolutely no clue what i would do in that kind of situation <laughs> It's that kind of love triangle. I feel like it's really hard to know whether or not. Mm -hmm. I like, think the oh, first thing I would be... do is panic. Yeah. You know, I think the first thing I would do is panic. Like, oh, ah, ah, yes, I'm holding it in my hands. Ah. Right? <laughs> yes. So as we have um, now uh, revealed here too. So Shane coerces Rita to open the letter. Shane reads it. And then they prep it off to send it. But Shane mentions that it's up to Oliver to send it. However, Norman accidentally sends it up the <laughs> overnight express shoot. Don't you love how the next day Oliver is like checking the shoot as if somehow it's yeah. like stuck up in Still there? Somewhere? there. <laughs> I'm like, it's been 24 hours, but it was it was quite damaged, you see? <laughs> <laughs> like, I have it up in there, and you're just like, it actually works, by the way. They the way that they pull it, they pull it up with string, by the way. That's how that happens. Like oh. Oh. Right. so it's not an actual pneumatic too, but that's fun fact. That is <laughs> yeah. a fun fact. Well, and the fact that Norman actually did accidentally send it off because he he was taking his time and then he saw the letter and, <gasps> and then his his hand just kind of reacted. And then, <laughs> did you notice how quick everyone is to be complicit? it in this so the one thing that kind of you know shocked me is okay so norman had no like real stake in kind of the outcome but yet he ch he's like oh nothing you know i didn't do anything and i didn't do it like, oh, I didn't no. do it. everybody's <laughs> complicit they're all like well we know what just happened but we're not going to tell him even people who you would think had just slightly less of a stake in the situation mm -hmm. still were kind of like on mom's side you know they were like well, we're going to make sure this change doesn't get uncovered here in this moment maybe nothing will ever happen you know it's just really I, that that just stuck out to me like when i was watching it last night i'm like they're so quick to become complicit in this right that yeah, is a right. really good point that is <laughs> funny i never would have thought of that yes. <laughs> right that's how that's how much love there is there which i think makes 
kind of, you know, what we know of the end, make a little bit more, make even a little bit more heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. So because much more. They are yes. so connected to her and they are so willing to kind of go that extra mile, even to just be like, oh, we didn't do anything. Nothing happened here. And then. Right. Exactly. For sure. Hey, you guys, I know you are all chomping at the bit to get back to our discussion about From Paris with Love. But first, I just wanted to share a quick word from today's sponsor, Care Of. Care Of is a wellness brand that makes it easy to maintain your health goals with a customized vitamin plan that helps you feel your best today and supports you long term. Care Of is focused on the quality, science, and research that goes into each of their products and recommendations. Plus, they use wholesome ingredients that you recognize like organic cocoa and pink Himalayan salt. Care Of's easy online quiz helps you find the vitamins and powders that will support your specific health goals, like improving your fitness routine or managing stress. The quiz took me just a few minutes and Care Of gave me some great recommendations, including the extra batteries quick sticks, because as a mom of two little ones, I'm always in need of a quick energy boost in the afternoons. Care Of can make taking your vitamins and supporting your health goals attainable, and it's hassle-free as your vitamins and supplements are delivered to you. So what are you waiting for? I'm excited to share that for 25% off each of your first three months of Care Of, go to takecareof.com slash hallmarkies25 and enter the code hallmarkies25. Again, for 25% off each of your first three months of Care Of, go to takecareof.com slash hallmarkies25 and enter code hallmarkies25. Now back to our show. So the, the next day, Holly receives the letter and setting up the stage here. Um, Rita has her speech that she does and Shane shares about the porch swing and they talk about how spring is coming and such a nice little talk between those um, Shane and Oliver, Shane, Rita, and Norman confess and um, Shane and Oliver take a visit to the Castellucci restaurant. So let's start at the, the Rita speech. Let's talk about Ramon. Um, Ramon. <laughs> Ramon. So there's a lot of conflict. There's so there's several things going on here. We have parallel stories with the divorce papers between Joey and Katie, Caitlin, and then Holly and Oliver. We also have three love, two love triangles ish kind of. We have the Holly Oliver Shane triangle. We also have kind of a Norman Ramon and Rita triangle. Poor sweet Norman. <laughs> All right. So as a viewer, did you feel that Ramon was an intentional threat to Norita or is he just a big flirt? And a flirt, as we've discovered in past episodes of this podcast, has varying definitions. So you take that how you want. But what do we feel about Ramon, especially in this, since he's Norman just gets so jealous of Ramon and Rita together? I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, because the first time that Ramon meets Shane, he acts like that Mm -hmm. with her. And, you know, and then later on, we don't know this at this point, but later on when he's having dinner with a beautiful meteorologist (laughs) he's he's acting just as just as fired up about her so I think he's always like that but on the other hand I think a little bit intentionally because Rita intrigues him Mm -hmm. and I don't think that she's necessarily a conquest but I think that Ramon has a bit of a hero complex, which is a little ironic because we talk about Oliver being a hero in this movie as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that he just needs to rescue someone. And uh, which, speaking of rescuing, taking off his own coat and scarf and leaving himself in just a suit in eight degree weather, idiot. (laughs) (laughs) He was gonna catch hypothermia. Anyway, so it just, I I don't know, it, I think, I think it's kind of a, I think it's kind of a 50-50 thing. Mm -hmm. 
I think Ramon is just comedic relief, 100%. If you think about kind of the gravity of the Holly Oliver, Shane situation, the Norman Rita Ramon thing is just a comedic, like opposite of that. Mm -hmm. There's kind of, you know, there's other dynamics going on there. And I feel like he's just somebody that Norman plays off of and you kind of see it throughout the series is like that they kind of keep going back and forth. I feel like every scene has to do something. So there has to be some kind of tension. So maybe it wasn't between like Oliver and Shane at that exact moment. It was in between, you know, Ramon and, you know, Norman or whatever. And Rita's just, you know, innocent and completely oblivious, just thinks he's being really sweet. But, you know, there's actually that tension going on kind of right behind her, which I think is kind of interesting. But I think he's mostly just there for comedic purposes and kind of like to make things a little bit lighter. But, you know, mm -hmm. things are going to only get heavier kind of on the backside of this movie. He yeah. also he also makes Norman own up to everything because <laughs> with, without mm -hmm. it, without him there, I think that this whole dancing thing would have stretched on forever if if Ramon hadn't been there to push things along. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I almost think Ramon is like a more likable Lester Kim Sickle. <laughs> like he's kind of there to shake things up, but he's a little more personable than the Lester. <laughs> They're both brilliant characters. I can't mm -hmm. even like I can't even separate them. They're both just such brilliant characters. And I'm in love with Lester Kinsicle. Me too. Yes, Team Lester because people don't like him. They like he's a great amazing. character. He's an amazing character. And I honestly, I was hoping that he would literally crash Norman and Rita's wedding. I just wanted him there. I was like, you know what? He would have been an excellent, just like kind of surprise guest. It's like he's there, like, you know, it's security. Like he, you know, something security related or like postal. Like he would go as like himself in a formal setting. Like, just be like, you know, I'm here because, you know, this is postal related, something like that. Like, he would have tried to get in and, like, crash. Like, oh, let's, oh, that let's have so him funny. do that at, let's have him do that at 100%. Shane and Oliver's wedding. Absolutely. I feel like that would probably be the better fit at this point, but I don't know. I was just kind of in a, let's bring everyone we can to the wedding. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was why too. Lester made my list when I had the opportunity to, like, share some things. I thought would be cool for 10. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had that thought today. I said, oh my gosh. We should have, for the Shane and Oliver wedding movie, we should have this reunion of a ton of their letter stories coming to wish them well, you know, because they've heard that they're getting married. And it just, I think that that would be so cool to have all of these characters that they've helped with their, with their dead letter skills and have them come and now be a part of their life because they were a part of theirs. I think that would be such an amazing way to do some kind of a reunion and ha is have a ton of them show up to the wedding. For sure. But before we get to a wedding, we got to get Holly out of here first. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so now it's confession time for Shane, Rita, and Norman. Um, while they're standing outside listening, not really listening to Rita's speech, Shane informs Oliver of her bad, her my bad. Um, and they go back to the DLO. Rita and Norman also kind well, Rita confesses her action. Norman kind of dances around it. Um, so what struck me here was Oliver's reaction to Rita versus his reaction to Shane. So as Rita is going on and she's like looking like she's about to cry and she's telling Oliver like, we just care so much about you. Oliver, his demeanor changes. He all of a sudden looks like, oh my goodness, I've just hurt a poor puppy. Like I've kicked a puppy in its gut and I feel really bad that I'm about to start yelling or like diving into clams and red wine or whatever it does he does when he's mad. But then it switches to Shane, like all his anger that he did not release on dear sweet Rita is gone straight to Shane. <laughs> and I just, it kind of made me giggle just a little bit just because of the, there's so much tension between Oliver and Shane, not necessarily because she sent the letter, but because there are feelings there and there's just this dynamic and there's this like white elephant in the room. Um, and he hasn't been able to get rid of that elephant to get to what he wants which is Shane and so I just thought that was so good I have a I have a quick question about Holly for you ladies so we do not actually see her face 
until she appears in the DLO and not even the first time she appears in the in the DLO. We don't see her face until Shane sees her in the DLO. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I don't know. I, I was trying to figure that out. I'm like, why are they going to these great lengths to hide her face? At first I thought that she was this huge, huge actress and they were doing a big reveal, but I didn't recognize her. And so I thought, well, maybe she is and I just have not heard of her and maybe she isn't. But then another thought occurred to me because Shane said that until they, until she looked up the address, she was just a concept. And so it, do you think that that is kind of something that they're symbolically doing that if she's without a face, she's just a concept. And then Shane comes face to face with her and she's forced to deal with the reality of the wife in a way that she never has before. So I what- I think all those things are true. Mm-hmm. Do you but I also think we actually do see her face before her, before uh, what's her, before uh, Shane does because when she goes into the office, she's walking around, mm -hmm. and the first thing you actually see her face doing, well, you see her one when she picks up the letter, so you do see her there. Um, but then, but it's just the side, her, and it's kind of hidden yeah, by yeah, hair. You also see her face when she picks up the um, the hat off the rack. You see her face. Not not it, full front though. Not not full front. And then, and then in the blizzard, in the flashback with the blizzard, she's all hooded yeah, that and everything. Definitely don't see her face. So, yeah, I just, I thought it was interesting that they, that they never showed her full front until, until uh, Shane comes face to face with her in the DLO. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Well, we will ponder that. <laughs> and then we'll talk about that in the Thursday segment. Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> But so Oliver is really upset right now and he can't speak a scary sentence and he has a flashback to when he saved Holly. Mm -hmm. um, so Shandell, when I was scoping out your blog, you mentioned the blizzard theory. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to share a little more about that? Okay, so um, essentially it's something I came up with to kind of describe the situation between kind of the spring winter thing that, that you know, is kind of recurring throughout from Paris with love. Um, when I think about um, sort of their relationship, I think that, you know, Oliver found Holly on that mountain, but he's never come down. He's never come off that mountain. Like the situation with Holly has become his winter and he's been going through it for a very long time. And the snow just keeps getting deeper and deeper and he's sinking in it. And he's then, you know, somebody, somebody, Shane kind of comes alongside him to start helping him dig out. And so the idea of blizzard theory is that essentially that, you know, he went up there to get Holly, but Shane actually ended up saving Oliver. Um, and so it's kind of that transitive property. Um, and so the idea is just essentially that, that they came alongside each other to sort of help each other through the situation. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the main things that you're seeing, mm -hmm. especially the um, line that he says while they're in the car, you know, don't be frightened. You know, we're going to get out of this. We just have to keep talking about it. You know, this is going to be, you know, we're going to get through this essentially. And I feel like that's exactly the kind of thing that Shane is saying the entire time, either throughout this movie, kind of like, you can't, you know, we need to talk about this. You can't avoid this. Like, this has been a terrible shock. There's things that, you know, you need to, mm -hmm. need to do, you know, you need to, you know, talk to Holly, you know, you haven't forgiven her, have you, you know, there's just these different things where she's trying to like help him transition out of this stage. Um, and so that's kind of what Blizzard Theory is about. It just kind of traces that through the series and then obviously through the movie as well. Yeah, that's such an interesting parallel too that I had not thought about because the winter theme is very much within this movie. It is winter. They talk about snow. They, they have a big emphasis on springtime. I mean, mm -hmm. from when he sings springtime in the Rockies and they talk about spring again. And then, you know, at the end, they talk about how spring is coming and that's such a great parallel. I mean, it's brilliance of Martha, for sure. You know, another thing I noticed, and I've never noticed this before, but Oliver really has this saving kind of need because in the in uh, the treasure box, 
when Shane says that she could be dancing with Ramon, he said, I would not allow that to happen. And then when he has the flashback to Holly in her car and in his car with him, and she says, I think we're gonna die in here. He said, I will not let that happen. He has this very, very big protective instinct mm -hmm. where he feels the need to protect everyone around him, including himself. Mm -hmm. with, and you can really see him become protective of himself uh, when it when it involves his feelings and his anger with Shane. But yeah, that was something that I noticed. Two, two times, pretty close together, he says, I will not allow that to happen. And it's, it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing when you start digging into his personality. Yeah, definitely. So Shane and Oliver go to the Castle restaurant to go talk to Caitlin about the divorce papers, but instead they meet her husband, Joey, and it turns out that they never got divorced in the first place. Um, Joey wants the papers back. Oliver says no because of protocol, blah, blah, blah. Shane is not happy with this. And I'm not going to lie, the first time I watched this and I heard this, like, <laughs> this diss, I had to pause it because I was laughing <laughs> So hard, so incredibly hard. Let me see if I can find the exact lines. All, yeah, you are a lot of things, Oliver Tool. Opinionated, a perfectionist, basically a human antique. <laughs> and I, she's not wrong, but I literally died. I have never heard of anybody being described as a human antique, but I love it. I love it. <laughs> That I tease my husband now about that because he's kind of got an old soul, even though we're like early 30s. <laughs> but it just makes me laugh inside. Um, but anyways, she also says, I never figured you for a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. I think he kind of deserved that one, though, because what I quite don't understand about this whole situation is that the person who sent the letter is basically asking to have the letter returned to him. And according to um, One in a Million, that is okay because Nikki tries to get her letter to Graham back and all she has to do is fill out a form and it's all good. So there should be, it shouldn't be against protocol for him to get the letter back. I wouldn't think because Nikki does it herself in One in a Million. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, but he didn't request the form, so. And <laughs> Oliver true. didn't offer him the opportunity. And you know, <laughs> Oliver didn't get the opportunity to request a form to get his letter back, <laughs> even though it had already transpired, you know, trans, you know, gone through the system essentially and come back. Like he, yeah. So he was just he was at that point where he just did not care because he was in that exact same situation mm -hmm. and didn't get to control it, and so he was controlling this instead. And yeah, he he's, ta he's taking it out on Joey to call him on it. And this is like my favorite scene because I feel like. Jesus, Holly's name is a curse word. Like, you can tell he hates hearing that word come out of her mouth. And I just love it. She's like, your letter to Holly. Like, it's, it's And I just love that because it's almost like it's a, a, a cuss word and he hates hearing it come out of her mouth. And that's when he starts to get nastier, which I didn't like. That hurt. Uh, but I don't even, obviously, it wasn't really about her. It was about, about him. Yeah. yeah, she added extra emphasis on when she said Holly. Holly, yeah, she turns around, like, she's gonna make sure, she's walking right towards him, she made sure he heard that, like, and that's what I love about that scene. I well, and it that. isn't fair, it isn't fair that Oliver is taking all of this out on Joey, because, mm -hmm. oh, he didn't do anything wrong, no. you know, it's, yeah, uh, Oh, man. And the way he chooses, chooses to take it out on Shane is, like, even worse. Telling her that, like, she had did have a commitment to doing yeah. her job well. I'm like, excuse me. Excuse me. Like, that really had nothing to do with her and everything to do with you right now. The mm -hmm. one thing right in my life, and then you just know it's about him. It's, it's about him. He's just still processing. And he's mm -hmm. transitioned to anger. And it's just all the things at once within an hour. And he's just needs to kind of snap, I guess. Yeah. And that was the line I wrote down was doing the one right thing in my life. And he just kind of trails off. And I was like, wow, you've got some. But he can control in his work life. Because yeah. his personal life is out of his control because Holly's not even there. He doesn't know where she's at. Nothing. Like the only thing he's been able to control over this past year is his work life. And even mm -hmm. that's a bit kind of blowing up in a way because Shane is there 
kind of even messing with that process. So I feel like he's responding to quite a bit in that moment. Which yeah. is funny because he says, my hands are tied here. He says that to Joey. So that implies that it's out of his control oh, when yeah. it's totally in, in his, his control. control. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's kind of resorting to all the little tricks, the little psychological things that we do ourselves in these moments that mm -hmm. are completely inconsistent, but point to one, you know, that consistent issue, underlying issue. Yeah. And then, too, I mean, the parallels between this, the two letter stories here, the Holly letter story and then the, the Joey Caitlin letter story, we have two couples who are headed for divorce. We have one that, you know, we have people that want their letters back people who have sent it accidentally and people who are getting it that aren't supposed to and all of these things. And then, you know, you have the ending where, you know, it, it works out for both couples, but it's just an interesting, it's an interesting letter story on the Joey and Caitlin side. Like it's not some random, I don't know, random story that has nothing to do with divorce, but I mean, the, the underlying theme is it's just brilliant on the writing and you know, I think that's what makes this movie such a great story because of all of these parallels. So constantly pushes very specific buttons and those buttons are, you know, kind of the core of what is supposed to be either gleaned or understood or transitioned or kind of, you know, put forth. And that's, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. It's, they don't waste anything. Martha never does. And that's what I love about this, this movie in particular, because I feel like constantly things are just like built, 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 built. And mm -hmm. if you think about it, this movie builds for the entire rest of the series in a way. It's the this shore and this shore to the next and to the altar. So like, you know that this was a starting point and an ending point kind of at the beginning, you know, kind of at the beginning of the film series piece, mm -hmm. which I just kind of think is fantastic. Right. All right. So we're going to head on to Thursday. So before Thursday, though, Shane shares that Holly has written a poem in French, and they are going to go get it translated by none other than Ramon. 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 Very multilingual. <laughs> <laughs> All of them romance languages, ladies. All yes. of them. All, All of them. them. All of them languages. <laughs> so on Thursday here, um, Ramon translates the poem. We meet Holly. Dun, dun, dun. Shane meets Holly. Oliver needs clams and red wine. They go to Castelluccio's to see Joey and Caitlin once again. And Oliver, or Ollie and Holly, meet for drinks. I can't even say it because it's just Holly and Holly. But also like you a think about boy. how traumatic it is for him because when you realize that like that's his mom may have called his dad may have called him that like you're like whoa he, that's pushing a very specific button mm -hmm. which you don't even really know about until later and it's like ooh, that hurts even more now <laughs> yeah for sure so when the postables go to ramon for translation we discover that the poem is about oliver saving holly from the blizzard or some nonsense like that so let's talk about the poem did you it's guys deep. we get it <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite line. It's deep. We get it. <laughs> Did you guys understand the metaphor though? Like Oliver obviously was still contemplating that. Did you guys get it all? There the the la okay, so I, I understood until the, the last line, the sun part. What shall I what shall I do now that I've seen the sun? Oh yeah, now that I've seen the sun. Yeah, I got it. A line that she's a, she's escaped now. <laughs> like yeah, she's out of the she's out of the marriage, and now so now she can see the sun. So she's free now. Now what can she do? What can she do to spread her wings? Oh yeah. Okay, I, I was still I took under a little differently. I actually took that as out of the sun, out of as, as in out of the blizzard, out yeah. of that situation because I, I think that's what brought them together. But now that she doesn't need to be rescued, and she's she wants to be her own person now that she's in the sun and wanting to to get out of that kind of thing, I guess. And then I also got, obviously, the other part of it is that, like, if you think about Oliver, he's kind of in, he's still in the blizzard, but, you know, something stronger than death, like love, Shane is calling him out to say, like, come on, like, we can do this, we're going to get out. And then if you remember the end of the movie, it's like, well, what did you do once you got out? Like, 
when you realize you were no longer Holly's husband, when, you know, when you had all this opportunity and freedom ahead of you, like, what choice did you make? And I feel like that's also it. It's like, what will he do now that he can see the sun? And then I also just thought it was a straight up spiritual reference because, you know, um, like that, you know, Jesus conquered death, hell and the grave to reach back it for, you know, my salvation, you know, and I was so I was kind of thinking of like something's beyond like stronger than death. I'm thinking about, you know, thinking about the faith aspect of it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of being like, you know, we're in a space where maybe we feel like we're trapped and we can't get out. And then like Jesus just kind of reaches down and says like, we're going to do this. We're going to get you out of here kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Yeah. See, it's deep. It's deep. Deep, deep. deep. That's Martha. <laughs> yeah. Deep. It's deep. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I was, I think I was stuck on, you know, what Je- had just, what Jess had said. Um, I was, it was just not connecting for me. So thank you for putting that into my head there and all those um translations it's deep um (laughs) all right so norman also finally admits his feelings for rita to oliver in kind of a roundabout way as ramon has taken rita and you know norman's worried that she's getting swept off her feet and oliver (laughs) i love this when he says to him to get a better broom i I just love that so so fun and then did you did you love did you i because i loved this the shock on ramon's face when rita starts dancing because we all saw the dancing and we all went (laughs) ah and so you see the shock on ramon's face and then three seconds later he's going at it (laughs) right along with her i just thought oh my gosh that is so Ramon. He's like, go with the flow guy. He's like, yeah, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was funny because you see his face. At first, he's like, what the heck is this? And then he's like, okay, I can dig it. Yeah, I can do it. Let's go. <laughs> I think Crystal said that this was like her favorite day on set when she just got to dance like crazy. And like, I, I got to do the Rita with her. So like, oh! we did some like just dancing in the background while they were filming. And it was totally fun. It was amazing. Martha filmed it. I kid you not. So like, it was great. Oh, so man. like, it's, it's a dance. She really gets into it. It's fantastic. I tweeted, great. I tweeted her once. I tweeted her once and I asked her about the dance. I said, what, what is the story? How on earth did you come up with that dancing style? And she answered me and she said, a lot of hours in front of the mirror and a lot of laughing from my husband. Yes. yes. I remember seeing that. You're right. <laughs> yes. So Ramon foreshadows to Shane, once we face the thing that we fear, they no longer have power over us, which is quite profound for Ramon. Yes, it is. And Ramon's deep. He's Surprisingly deep. profound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like she did not even imagine that he could, something that like that could come out of his mouth. Like she just did he, not know he was even capable of something so profound. And that I he could possibly that even moment, form yeah. those words. <laughs> those words out of his mouth. Right. So Shane leaves her colleagues at the mailbox girl as one is, you know, talking to Ramon. One you is have five minutes brooding. to be weird. <laughs> one is brooding over R- Ramon and one is contemplating the poem that would be Rita, Norman, and Oliver. So Shane goes to the DLO by herself of all times for her to go back to work by herself. <laughs> She just, you know, waltzes in there, puts her stuff down, looks up, sees that there is a purse and stuff hanging up by Oliver's hat. And Holly. So before we get there with Shane and Holly, let's really quick talk about Holly's grand entrance. So she sniffs Oliver's hat, plays with the trinkets on his desk, the Eiffel Tower, the silver box engraved to Oliver, my hero. Um, one thing the one thing that struck me is the fact that Oliver still has his wedding band on. Holly does not have a ring on her left hand. She has one on her right middle finger, which is kind of like ugh. very indicative. <laughs> well, it's also kind of heartbreaking because you see that one has been very committed to, despite the fact that he may no longer love Holly anymore and despite the fact that he wants to move on, but he has been true to his word. He has upheld his end of the bargain of being married and, you know, making sure that his ring is on his finger symbolically or whatever. And she's not like 
this is a rated G series, but who knows what Holly had been doing in Paris. Okay, let's be real there. Okay. <laughs> Especially with her left ring finger gone. Like, I mean. <sighs> I just thought all the items more or less had to do with her. I feel like her intention was kind of clear is that she really only cared about herself in a sense that like. She picks up the the thing that she obviously had engraved for him. She picks up the Eiffel Tower thing. I mean, and if you mm-hmm. why does he have back, an Eiffel Tower? Uh, why does you, he well, have an Eiffel Tower? I don't know, but if you think how far back, like even she must be in this because he hasn't even worn that hat since the pilot. So for her mm-hmm. to pick that up, it's like she's so out of touch with like who and where he's at. And what I love about this kind of object lesson that we see here is at the end when Shane has a chance to be alone with his desk, she zeroes in on his favorite letter opener. Like, mm-hmm. and that he even is like, this is my favorite letter opener. So, like, it's the most meaningful and profound thing that he has. And she picks that up. So, like, I really like how those two kind of moments, even though they're separated by time, mm-hmm. are kind of, like, identical in a sense. You see who knows whom best. And you know, I yeah. kind of like the, there's a parallel kind of going with that. Um, I don't know if it was intentional on Martha's part, but when we uh, see Holly, she's in the chair and does, it's the back facing and she spins around, which is exactly how we get Shane higher ground. And it's almost like, you know, Shane is becoming like the new Holly because she's moving that into is Holly's on purpose, position. Actually. Is that is on purpose. I, I, I saw the same mm-hmm. thing. She asked oh my God. Car what direction she Holly turns in the chair. I was like, uh, and I, I had to think about it for a minute. And I was like, um, clockwise. And they're like, see, it's clockwise because they were trying to figure out for the next day what way she should be turning in the chair. Oh. So they did it on purpose. And if you think about it, in that, just because I know this is, like, not with this movie, but we'll just go there for, like, two seconds, but she commands the space in the exact same way that Holly does. Like, you know, she walks around, Mm -hmm. she surveys the landscape, she asks questions, like, she's acting out of some of that same kind of, it's it's kind of the psychological trigger, if you think about it, for Oliver, you know, Mm -hmm. because somebody who's coming back, and that she's acting out of the same kind of anger that she's got coming back from, you know, that situation in higher ground, and they're trying yeah. to get it resolved, mm-hmm. and that same tension is there, but, like, that's 100% on purpose. They're paralleling those scenes, like, on purpose. And again, it just shows Martha's amazing writing and the weaving that she mm-hmm. does and the connections that she makes. Like, that takes a lot of work. Like That does. <laughs> that is, and, yeah, a lot of work, a lot of great memories, because one thing that drives me nuts about series, not this series necessarily, but other series, is the, um, the continuity issues. There are, like, rarely any continuity issues in the series. Like, it is very interwoven, and the details and everything is just so on point. And that's one thing I appreciate about Sign Seal Delivered is, is all of that. All right. So, Shane and Holly. Holly offers Shane a yoo Who does that? <laughs> Holly. <laughs> owns those yoo honey. She half owns those. She's still married to him. Oh my so gosh. She is such an airhead. <laughs> I mean, just this woman who obviously works there at the DLO. Hello. Would you like a you who? Who died and made you Queen Shiva? <laughs> <laughs> very intimidating. It's very intimidating. Well, yeah, but I'm just the entire conversation. Holly mm-hmm. is so out of it yeah like she's offering her a youtube she says oh that man can kiss I'm like, girl you are talking to a co-worker she knows nothing about their history she just sees this woman walk in and she oh that that entire conversation makes me cringe because she is so out of it and such an airhead but do you know who Holly is based off of? Do you, do you ever think that the character might actually have some origin somewhere in, like, film history? I did not. Holly Golightly, have you, if you've seen Breakfast at Tiffany's, she I actually, have. there's actually quite a bit about Holly's character that is very much derived from Holly Golightly, I would say. Because I it went back sense. and watched that movie because I was like, you know what I feel like? And I literally could do, I could put, like, lines of Holly's dialogue over top of scenes from breakfast at Tiffany's that would almost like you would not even know the difference so I'm pretty sure like some of like that like kind of airheadness that you kind of get from Holly is actually based on that character and I wouldn't be surprised it's a classic movie and like I feel Mm -hmm. like there was kind of all that classic movie vibe that this movie really had from the score to like everything else I think that's why because it bugged me for the longest time 
and, but I feel like that's why that her character is sort of like based off of that. Huh. She's still an airhead. You know? still airhead <laughs> but, or at least feels like one. Yeah. Uh. Um, yes. And Shane is also very obviously uncomfortable playing it cool. Base, and, and I put down in my notes, she, her, in her head, she's going, nah, bro, I do not have a crush on your husband. I'm going to go along with this. <laughs> um but yeah along with holly sharing that that man can kiss which okay am i for someone you just met (laughs) that's Uh, what i'm saying i'm pretty certain in higher ground she's kissing him in nearly the same spot geographically within the dlo you know i think you're right yeah yeah so Um, yeah and he also she also overshares that oliver (laughs) has clams and red wine when he's very very angry it's all also- of these random things that have absolutely no bearing on the two of them meeting. You're just like, and she doesn't. Holly never gets Shane's name. No, precisely one of my points. And <laughs> like you, because she obviously has. She knows Norman and Rita because she's like, did Norman and Rita still work here? And they're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, tech support. I mean, you could say hi. You know what's your name sweetheart or whatever i mean (laughs) so creepy i would not have been here for that i would have been like this is too much let's back it up (laughs) all the horses like we Um, are the same age we are the same age (laughs) so before we go on i just have to say this whole scene here it's it's so there's so many emotions there's like anger because it's holly and she's like not supposed to be there there's like almost a sadness for shane because and kind of like an empathy kind of thing going on for the viewers because we're like oh you are now talking to the wife the person that's been a figment in your imagination who's now a person there's also confusion because why is holly offering a yoo-hoo's and talking about her (laughs) husband being able to kiss really well like inappropriate awkward there's a lot of things going on here. And did you it, say shock? I shock? didn't hear. Sh- I didn't shock. hear shock. Shock. One hundred percent. Trauma actively occurring right there. Yes. For, for yeah. Shane at, like clearly, and I almost wonder too if there wasn't a little bit of an aggressiveness on Holly's end, like that she kind of wasn't just like asserting her like position. Like mark, right. mark your territory. Yes. 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 And yes. I feel like it, it's so. What she's so. <sighs> She seems so like airheaded that it almost seems like it's it's accidental, but it's kind of on purpose. <laughs> like I may be projecting something onto her that like is not intended, but I don't know. I just feel like there's a little bit. That's why she's so dismissive almost and like doesn't bother to find out her name. Like tells her all, all this mm-hmm. stuff to like kind of remind her if like she thought she had any other intentions. Or like not, Oliver's like, mind. But, <laughs> Stay away. But not that she wanted him anyway. She wanted out of the house. So there's right. like, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there. But as like a woman, wouldn't you still kind of want to be like, well, that's also my husband, but he's not my ex husband yet. So by the way, you know, I don't know. I've never been in that situation. So I can't speak to what that would feel like. But yeah. yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Wow. So you guys, this has been so much information in such a short period of time. We have gone zero to 60, 100 miles in like an hour, you guys. So I know you guys all want us to talk about Oliver, but we are going to save that for next week. So stay tuned for part two of our recap of From Paris with Love from Cami, Chandel, Casey, and Jess. Um, and before we go, please follow us. Where can people find you? I'll start with Cami. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Cami Drama Girl, on Facebook, the Hooked Hardy Facebook page, and my blog is hookedhardy.com. And Jess, where can people find you? You can find me at Jess BSW blog on Twitter and Instagram, or check out my website, beneathstillwaters.com. And Chandel, where can people find you on your blog? Um, alaminadowning.weebly.com is the website. You can find Alameda and Downing on Facebook and also on Twitter at Alameda Downing. Awesome. And you can find me at Hallmark My Words on Twitter. You can also find us, Deliver Me a Podcast, on all social medias. 
except for Facebook and Hallmarkies podcast. Be sure to follow them too, because we are a part of the Hallmarkies podcast. Also go to the Hallmarkies podcast merch store where we do have a lots of postable things for you to buy and enjoy and gift to other fellow postables. And um, that's a wrap for tonight. We will see you next week talking all about Oliver, Holliver, Shalliver, Norita, and everybody else. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.